Hello everyone, today I'm going to be doing something slightly different than that I normally do. I'm going to be reading an extract from a book called Incredible Phenomena, The Unexplained File. It's quite an old book, it was one of my dad's and from the inside it says it's from the 1980s. So it's got some quite interesting things in it. But if this video proves successful and people are interested, I'll read some other extracts from it. So today I'm going to do a article um, from the, a chapter called Con Connection and Coincidence. So from the sounds of that, I'm going to be doing a story about um, two women that were murdered and a coincidence. You might have seen this over the internet because I've seen it before and I always thought it was one of them creepypastas, but until I was flicking through this book just a few moments ago, trying to find an article to read to you, I noticed the picture that I'm going to put on screen now. And it's one that I've seen quite a lot on these little... I don't know what to call them. I won't call them a meme, but they do say, like, oh, this woman... Um, well, anyway, we'll get to it. I'm not going to ramble. So today I'm going to be reading slightly different. This is going to be more me reading this book to you and hopefully it's different because I know that in previous videos people have gone, oh, you're, you're mumbling and you need to reread through, but this is quite a long, long read, so... I might end up cutting this out, I don't know. But we'll see, we'll follow it. So this is from the chapter Connection and Coincidence from the book Incredible Phenomena by Brian Inglis. A tale of two murders. Two murders committed in the same place on the same day, but exactly 157 years apart, with the suspected murderer named Fortin in each case. This is a bizarre Erringdon affair, but was there anything more than coincidence involved? If the principles underlying astrology are correct, people born in the same place or similar astrological conditions should have broadly similar lives. There is certainly no lack of an anecdotes about people born at the same time on the same day, many years apart, with the same astrological conditions prevailing at the two dates whose lives they may have indeed revealed marked similarities. One of the better known examples is that of Queen Elizabeth I and the late Dame Edith Sitwell. Although they were both born 350 years apart, they had much in common, even down to their facial similarities. Their birth charts displayed many intriguing resemblances. Both were born on the 7th of September, between 3 o'clock and four o'clock in the afternoon and both had the ascending sign of capricorn in their horoscopes neither women were welcomed into their world lady sitwell dame edith's mother wanted the firstborn to be a boy while e elizabeth's mother anne boleyn suffered execution through giving birth to a daughter as henry the eighth desperately wanted a son neither elizabeth nor dame Ed edith married each wrote verse and was subject to melancholic fits. There appears, however, to be a certain amount of evidence suggesting that not only do people who are born on the same dates on which the prevailing astrological conditions, the alignments of the planets, are similar, suffer similar fates, but the events that occur in those dates can bear uncanny resemblances to one another. The strange case of the identical Erringdon murders apparently come into this category. Two girls of the same age and according to some sources the same birth dates were the victims of murders committed on the same day of the same year but for different time of 157 years. The identical factors in the two cases are so striking and so numerous that it could be argued that some kind of astrological influence must have governed the actions of those who committed the crimes. On the 27th of May 1817, 
20-year-old Mary Ashford was found dead, apparently murdered at Erringdon, then only a village five miles eight kilometres outside of Birmingham. On the 27th of May 1974, Barbara Forrest, aged 20, was strangled and left in long grass near the children's home in Erringdon, at which she was a nurse. Then, in itself, it is perhaps a remarkable coincidence, but no more. It is when one examines each case in detail that the identical factors begin to pro proliferate. Both in 1817 and 1974, Whit Monday was on the 26th of May. Barbara Forrest and Mary Ashford had both been raped before being murdered and their bodies were found within 40 yards, 360 metres of one another. It appears though there must have been some doubt about this in the case of Mary Ashford, that there were attempts by the killers to hide the respective bodies. And the coincidences did not end there. Both girls had visited a friend early in the evening of the Whit Monday to change into a new dress and to go out for a dance. After each murder, a girl was arrested. Oh, after each murder, a man was arrested, and in each instance his name was Fortin. To round off this narrative of astonishing parallels, both men were charged with murder but were acquitted. It was then the police were checking through archives after Barbara Forrest's death that they came across full reports of the murder in 1817 and noted the similarities with amazement. At 6.30am on the 27th of May of that year, a labourer making his way to work in Erringdon found a pile of bloodstained female garments not far from Penn's Mill. He reported this to the police and a search of the whole area was carried out. Eventually two footprints, those of a man and a woman, were discovered leading into the direction of the flooded sandpit. The footsteps ended at the edge of the water in the pit. This was searched and the body of Mary Ash had retrieved from it. Her clothing was bloodstained and there were bruises on her arms. She was well known locally and it was not, no, it was not long before all of her movements of the previous day were traced. On Whit Monday, 26th of May, she had travelled from Erringdon to Birmingham to sell dairy produce at the market, having arranged to go to the Whitsuntide, Whitsuntide dance at Tyburn House Inn that evening. She returned to Erringdon about 6pm, went to a friend's house and changed into a new print dress for the dance, to which she accompanied by a girl named Hannah Cox. The two girls thoroughly enjoyed themselves at the dance, which ended about midnight. For those, for most of the evening, Mary Ashford danced with a young bricklayer named Abraham Fortin. He, Mary Hannah Cox and her partner, Benjamin Carter, walked towards their respective homes as far as a place now called Old Cuckoo, a little short of Erringdon village. Hannah and Benjamin then went off in another direction. At about 3.30am on the 27th of May, Mary Ashford was seen walking towards the home of Mrs Butler, Hannah Cox's mother. Evidence was given that she was walking very slowly and alone. Arriving at Mrs Butler's house, Mary changed her party dress for her working attire and at 4am she said goodbye to Hannah Cox and said she was going home. Mary was seen twice before twice more after leaving Mrs Butler's house. Joseph Dawson testified to see her alone at 4.15 in Bell Lane and ten minutes later Thomas Broadhurst swore that he too saw her unaccompanied in the same lane. After the discovery of her body, Abraham Fortin was interviewed and questioned about the murder. I can't believe she is murdered, said Fortin. Why? I was with her until four o'clock this morning. Although astonished to hear that Mary had been murdered, it did not dawn on him for a moment that he was suspected of having killed her. Later that day, however, Fortin was taken into custody and searched. He admitted having sexual intercourse with the girl, but denied rape or murder. Although medical evidence in the area could hardly be called scientific or be compared to the forensic evidence of today, the suggestion was that Mary had been sexually assaulted. In this 
disposition, Abraham Thornton confirmed that he and Mary had walked home part of the way with Mary, Hannah Cox and Carter. When Carter and Hannah left us, Mary and I walked on over the fields until we came to a stile, he stated. We sat talking for about a quarter of an hour. Soon afterwards, we went to the green at Erringdonton, where I waited outside while Mary changed her dress. But Mary did not come out of the house, so, being tired of waited, I went home alone. Fortunately for Thornton, there was confirmation that he was alone around this time. A Mr Holden, together with another man and woman, testified to seeing him. As too did John Hayden, a gamekeeper who talked to him for a quarter of an hour. Further to his testimony, William Jennings, a milkman, stated, I saw Abraham Thornton about 4.30 in the morning, walking alone. No one had seen Mary and Thornton together after they were sighted at 3am at a stile at the top of Bell Lane. The two had been seen by various people in this period, but always each was alone. They were never together. There was also the fact that the distance in a straight line from the flooded sand pits to the point where Thornton was last seen was nearly one and a half miles, 2.4 kilometres, or by the route Thornton himself claimed to have used, two miles, or 3.2 kilometres. This fact alone, combined with the fact, time factor, meant that at least some of the testified evidence was false. If Thornton walked to Erringdonton with Mary, as he claimed, and then those witnesses who asserted that they saw Mary in, alone in the Bell Lane must have been mistaken. Equally, it was clear that if Thornton's story had was to be relieved, the footsteps of a man that were found leading across those fields in the direction of the flooded sand pit could not have been his. Yet, the female footprints were positively identified as belonging to Mary Ashford by two working men at the nearby mill who removed the dead girl's shoes and measured them against the footprints. Abraham Thornton was brought to trial in August 1817 at the Warwick Assize Church before Mr Justice Holroyd. The case attracted considerable attention and a contemporary account of the trial stated that by six o'clock in the morning great numbers of people had assembled between the gates of the country hall. The charge was that, not having the fear of God before his eyes, but being moved by the indignation of the devil, Abraham Thornton willfully murdered Mary Ashford by throwing her into a pit of water. I think that he was further accused of having raped that the said body of Mary Ashford. Thornton pleaded not guilty on both accounts. Such medical evidence as there was came from a surgeon, George Fre Freer who said that when he examined the girl, he found a quantity of duckweed and water in her stomach and decided she had died from drowning. The just jury's decision was clear. In six minutes, they declared Fortin not guilty. Today, the verdict would settle all arguments, but in the early part of the century, under, under an ancient law, it was possible for William Ashford, Mary's brother, to appeal against the verdict and so demand a second trial. This was fixed for the 17th of November, 1817, and Thornton was then appeared before Lord Ellingborough at the Court of the King's Bench. At this trial, Thornton made legal history by being the last man in Britain to take advantage of an old law called Trial by Battle. This involved Thornton renewing his plea of not guilty and throwing down a gauntlet from the dock for the right to challenge William Ashford to trial by battle. Not guilty, Thornton declared. I am ready to defend this plea with my body. Thereupon, Ashford's counsel disputed Thornton's right to trial by battle, claiming that it was an obsolete practice, which was long since been out of use. But Lord Ellingborough ruled that it was the law of England. If Ashford had picked up the gauntlet, the two would have fought with weapons until one was beaten or gave in. If Thornton had lost, he would have been executed immediately. If he had won, he would have been freed. Having had no response to his challenge by the 21st of April 1818, Thornton was formally discharged. He later emigrated to the United States. 
The mystery of Mary Ashford's death lies not so much in the fact that her killer was never disclosed as in the admittedly remote possibility that this might not have been a case of murder. On the other hand, Barbara Forrest's death seems quite definitely to have been caused by strangulation. Her body, also partly clothed, was found hidden by long grass in the ditch some eight days after she disappeared. She worked at the Pipe Hayes Children's Home. Michael Thornton, a Birmingham child care officer who also worked at the as a supervisor at the home, was charged with her murder. At the trial in March 1975, Mr Justice Croom Johnson ruled that there was insufficient evidence to continue the trial and directed the jury to find Fortin not guilty. Despite the fact that the prosecution had had the entire seven months during which Fortin had kept in Winston Green prison to prepare its case, it was unable to offer any positive evidence against him. There is one dissimilarity between these two so similar murders that is curiously extraordinarily striking. Mary Ashford's body was found within a few hours, although Errington was then a village and her body was hidden in a flooded sandpit, yet, while Errington today is a built-up area of Birmingham, it took more than a week before Barbara Forrest's body was found in the ditch. And there are two off other strange features of these cases. Although there is, of course, no photograph of Mary Ashford, Sketches of her drawn after the celebrated trial suggest a marked resemblance to Barbara Forrest. A fellow worker with Barbara Forrest also declared that about ten days before Barbara was murdered, she was heard to say, This is going to be my unlucky month, I just know it. Don't ask me why. To follow this hypothesis too far leads quickly to absurdities. But the twin Errington murders remain enigmatic and not quite dismissible as mere coincidences so that's the end of me reading that chapter it actually didn't take as long as i thought it was going to take actually um i am now going to show you some of the i'm going to show you the pages now that i've read from and you can see some of the pictures that i would have already hopefully put on the video by now whilst i was reading it is quite interesting, isn't it? But I think now that I've read this story, it is purely a coincidence. Because before, when I seen this meme on the internet, when I was a bit sceptical, I thought, mm, you know, it could there could be some supernatural element to it. But now, like, I've read into it more. I do think that first murder in 1817 was definitely a drowning. But I don't know. It's, it's quite strange because we'll never know. It does sound weird that, like, I do think it's a very, very strange coincidence, but I think it's merely that. I, do, I don't think there's anything supernatural about it because you've just got to think about all the murders and whatever that's happened in history in the past that we've not even heard about ones that we don't even know about and they could happen on the same days as well-known cases but we just don't know but i just thought i'd do something a bit different with my with a video because like i just think this book's really interesting so you'll have to let me know what you think of this video i know i'm kind of rambling right now because i'm just talking off the top of my head i haven't got anything written down but I thought I'd just do my video a bit different this time. Um, I'm just flicking to the chapter page. Oh, the book is called Incredible Phenomena, like I said, but it's not written by that John English. It's edited by Peter Brooksmith, but that John English writ an introduction for it. So there is uh, quite a bit to read about. There's, like, bits about... Um, human combustion, um, human glowworms, uh, the gentle art of murder, trial by fire, the mystery of fire, the human salamander, resting in peace, a grave condition, mysteries of the human bonfire, that's one, that's combustion, 
the uncrackable code that one's undermined magic um the creatures of the impossible fishy tail that sounds interesting historical mysteries oh i like them ones who killed the king i think that one's about richard iii but we kind of like i said this book is quite old let me have a look um so this edition of the book is was released in 1984 long before i was born um and it's it's really quite interesting like do you know what when i was growing up i was aware of this book but i always thought it was right creepy because on the front i'm going to show you a picture now it's like a man walking over a fire with like tambourines or something in his hands and i thought it was really scary and i never really wanted to look at it but then like last year after my dad died i was looking through like his books and then like it just caught my eye because it said unexplained file on the side and i thought oh you know what that actually sounds really interesting because I'm, un I'm interested in that sort of thing like the unexplained because i like to think about oh what might have happened and i just i find it crazy like i knew my dad liked that sort of stuff anyway but it's just like it's like the book the book was calling out to me as if to say take me take me because i'm not gonna get read by anybody else you know so i took it my mom knows about it but yeah if you liked me reading that and if you're quite interested in me reading about any of the other stories and articles you know i can i can try i can try and read them there's one about the oak island money pit which you know is really interesting there's that documentary about it on the history channel i've not watched it since the second season so i don't know if they've found out what the oak money pit's all about you know so like if i was to do a, like that one i'd have to obviously do read this article whatever in the book and then like follow up by with the program because that's obviously got new information but yeah it's about aliens like so much with this book it's <sighs> let me see what the, bib the bibliography says this is yeah why do people burst into flames what really happened at hanging hanging rock do curses kill this volume investigates the area of human experience and power that cannot be explained away by conventional science. Its chapters include The Human Enigma, The Limits of the Human Body and Spirit, Minds and Magic, The Power of the Occult, Creatures of the Impossible, Animals that Defy Nature, Historical Mysteries, A Fascinating Look at the Puzzles of the Past, The Cottingly Fairy Tale, The Story of the Two Girls Who Claim to Photograph Fairies. That one's really interesting. Well, we all know that's fake now, but I could, I could still read it because I find it interesting still connection and coincidence which is what i've read slightly today occurrences too incredible to ex be explained away by chance profiles of the paranormal people with mysterious abilities worldwide wonders bizarre phenomena from around the world so yeah i'm gonna try and stop rambling now um i might i've put a screenshot up now well not a screenshot a sh um a photograph of the contents page and if any of you are interested just write in the comments it what what if you look at the con contents page so that tickles your fancy just write in the comments below and i'll see if i can read it uh, and if not you know i won't do any more of these videos i just thought i'd do something different because you know it's just something a bit more light-hearted and just something a bit different just to break up the videos and stuff just something a bit more i can't really say light-eyed did i just say that but yeah so anyway i'll um see i put a link on my description box if i can find a link to the actual book but i don't actually think they make this book anymore but i'm gonna see if i can find the other books in the series because it's part of a series called the unexplained files but we'll just have to see yeah what's the like i'll take it like i'll put a picture now of the, of the uh cover so yeah thank you all for watching and i hope you all have a nice day and i'll stop rambling now god this video is long i'm just looking at my um timer and it's staying 21 but that's because I've broken it up into things, so it's going to be longer than 21 minutes. Okay, I'm going to get going now. If you don't already, you can follow me on Instagram to keep notified about my video content. And 
put any suggestions, it's most probably, you can reach out to me just as easy on YouTube as on Instagram, you know, with the direct messages. Sometimes it doesn't tell me if I've got a message. I actually have to go on to my messages to find out because my Instagram app isn't very good. So you might even need to comment on one of my pictures to say, I've sent you a direct message on Instagram, you know. This is on Instagram, obviously. But, uh, you know, I'm just going to ram- I'm stop rambling. I'll stop rambling. Okay, then. Thank you all. And I hope you've enjoyed this new video format, uh, per se. Um, and I hope to see you all again soon. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you're going to give me any feedback, be kind. Don't be just like, oh, I don't like your rambling. It's, it's nonsense. Just say, oh, well, I think you could do it a bit better this way. So, you know, constructive feedback, not just moaning for the sake of moaning. Okay, I'm going to get going now. Okay, then, thank you all. Have a nice day and goodbye.